All right, so I'm going to talk about the work uh, with uh, Matteo Bagioli, and it's based, uh, it's based on this paper. So um, over, the last, uh, over the last years, uh, I think one of the remarkable things uh, we learned from uh, um, uh, holography uh, is at, with direct applications to real world is that relativistic hydrodynamics uh, is an effective field theory. Uh, so the way how we can think about effective field theory in a context or hydrodynamics in a context of effective field theory uh, as follows. Um, so first we start with ideal hydrodynamics. Well, so ideal hydrodynamics, you can think of this as just uh, uh, a boosted uh, equilibrium state, right? So it's characterized uh, for simple uncharged fluids by the energy density and pressure. And so then uh, we can slowly build up this uh, um, um, effective field theory by basically adding um, higher, higher order gradient, uh, um, higher order derivative operators uh, to the hydrodynamics. And so as we all know, uh, to first order, we get the so-called Navier-Stokes hydrodynamics. Uh, and so Navier-Stokes hydrodynamics is a one, uh, one derivative extension of ideal hydrodynamics. So uh, in relativistic context, uh, we can do the um, decomposition into various structures. So one of them uh, is a shear tensor, the other one is a, uh, a bulk tensor, if you wish. Uh, and, uh, and so here we have uh, two transport coefficients, the shear viscosity and the bulk viscosity. And of course, uh, having uh, ADI-CFT correspondence tells us that we don't have to stop here. And so in fact, uh, in fact there is, uh, uh, there is uh, an infinite set uh, of derivative corrections, and that's, that's our effective field theory. So uh, as lots of effective uh, field series, so, so here you can think of as a uh, weak coupling, uh, in some sense, uh, small derivatives. Uh, and, and so, uh, as usual in physics, uh, when we have this uh, uh, infinite order derivative or infinite order weak coupling expansions, the, uh, the resulting series that we get are asymptotic series, and there is an interesting physics associated with it. Uh, and so, this is exactly what I want to talk about. Uh, however, uh, so as I stated so far, it's almost intractable problem. Uh, and it's almost intractable problem because there are lots of derivatives and you can imagine that uh, you can start uh, contracting um, these gradients. Um, that there are lots of tensor structures. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to simplify uh, in uh, two steps. So the first step, I'm going to focus on something that doesn't have any, uh, any indices. And so in particular, uh, what I'm going to be looking at, uh, I'm going to focus uh, on the entropy production rate. Uh, and so uh, uh, I can uh, uh, write down the entropy production rate, uh, basically a one over equilibrium temperature T, uh, and then there is some functional. And so this functional depends on all derivatives uh, of, uh, uh, of my hydrodynamic flow. So it is uh, well known uh, that, um, uh, <coughs> So the leading, uh, the, leading terms, uh, the leading terms in the entropy production are due to uh, viscous coefficients in your hydrodynamics. Uh, and so in particular, uh, here you can see explicitly the ratio of the bulk viscosity uh, to the entropy density and shear viscosity to the entropy density coupled to two, uh, to two different uh, uh, tensor structure of the velocity gradients. Uh, so this is one simplification, right? And so now uh, what people usually do when they ask the question, what's uh, uh, the, large, uh, the large order structure of the hydrodynamic expansion, they focus on some symmetric flows. Uh, so uh, so that's, that's as far as I know. So, um, uh, so people usually focus either on boost invariant expansion. Uh, this is not what I would like to do. Instead, I'm going to uh, look at a different type of flow. It's equally symmetric and it's simple to analyze. Uh, so this is a so-called homogeneous and isotropic expansion. So how you can think about homogeneous and isotropic expansion? Uh, well, so uh, in a, a, a local, so this is a flow uh, with um, a, a local rest frame velocity, uh, which is just one zero zero zero. However, the derivative uh, of this uh, local velocity is non-zero, uh, and so it's just some constant number. So alternatively. Uh, 
instead of thinking of it as a hydrodynamic flow, what you can think of is that uh, you take your plasma, you take your fluid, and you just put it inside uh, a de Sitte universe. And so this is sort of an alternative uh, description how you can sort of trade the flow in terms of uh, expansion of the background geometry. So, so the two descriptions uh, are equivalent. So uh, what I want to emphasize uh, that for this particular flow, uh, unlike the boost invariant flow, uh, the shear tensor identically vanishes. And so you immediately see already here that if I want to focus on the entropy production, uh, if there is any entropy production, it will come from bulk viscosity. So that already tells me that if I want to push this thing forward, um, I need to focus on uh, non-conformal examples uh, of fluids. And this is something that um, uh, Costas uh, gave a, an excellent overview earlier today. Uh, so uh, so let, me, um, uh, let me be a, a little bit sketchy here. So the idea is that uh, we have uh, a Lagrangian of a non-conformal gauge series. Uh, and so, uh, so we get this non-conformal gauge theory by starting uh, with uh, a conformal fixed point. Uh, and then we deform it uh, by uh, relevant operator uh, of dimension delta. So everything that I'm going to talk about is going to be uh, to uh, leading order uh, in this um, uh, coupling constant. Uh, so in other words, um, uh, if I focus on the uh, uh, equilibrium configurations in my non-conformal plasma, uh, then those equilibrium configurations um, uh, correspond to RG flow, which is very close to a conformal fixed point. And so now, uh, if you ask the question, uh, what would be the entropy production for the homogeneous and isotropic uh, expansion in a uh, non-conformal plasma, uh, then uh, what you will find out uh, basically by uh, this overall factor comes from uh, uh, dimensional analysis. So over here you see H squared. So this H squared uh, basically came from, uh, um, uh, from this divergence uh, of the velocity profile, uh, which is a Hubble constant. You can see it over here. Uh, and then the rest, again, as I said, is just dimensional analysis. However, there is this very interesting function, omega. Uh, so this function omega, uh, it is this function uh, that uh, encodes uh, all derivatives uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the flow that we're interested in. And so, um, uh, the, uh, so we made a very uh, simple choice of the flow. Uh, and the simplicity uh, is characterized by the fact uh, that despite I'm having all these arbitrary gradients with arbitrary contractions, it just becomes uh, a function of the ratio of h over t. Okay, so now, um, uh, now what we can do is actually look at some very specific examples, and in specific holographic examples, we can compute this function. And so uh, um, doing order-by-order uh, order hydrodynamic expansion, it simply means um, that we do an expansion in this parameter h over t that's supposed to be small. So the smallness of this parameter tells us how close we are to the adiabatic expansion. And so in these explicit examples, uh, what you will find out is uh, that this coefficient Cn has this nice property. Cn plus 1 divided by Cn uh, is proportional to n, uh, which implies uh, that uh, this is an asymptotic uh, series uh, and uh, uh, has a zero radius of convergence. Good. Uh, so what I told you so far uh, is actually an old story. Uh, so, um, uh, well, not, not that old, so it's been known uh, uh, since uh, 2013 due to the uh, seminar work by Michal Heller, uh, Romald Janik, and others. Uh, and so what we, learned, uh, what we learned from those discussions is that hydrodynamic expansion has zero radius of convergence. Um, uh, and uh, so, so the interesting thing is that this series uh, can be Borel resumed. So those of you who are not familiar, I will, uh, uh, later on in my talk, uh, I will explain to you what I mean by that. Uh, and uh, so what's interesting is that after you do uh, this resummation, you can actually identify what is the physics that's responsible uh, for the, um, uh, 
uh, for, for the zero radius of convergence of your hydrodynamic expansion. Uh, and in the case, uh, in the case of uh, um, uh, a fluid, a relativistic fluid hydrodynamics, as those gentlemen taught us, uh, so this is the physics of uh, non-hydrodynamic modes. Uh, and uh, uh, previous, uh, previous speaker uh, reminded you that those non-hydrodynamic modes, those are the quasi-normal modes. Okay, so this is a story uh, of a fluid hydrodynamics. So now, uh, uh, I was very happy that I can use something uh, uh, that uh, I worked when I was a student. Uh, so that's before I decided to do uh, anything related with uh, string theory. Uh, and so this is a work with Jim Satna that we did uh, in 1996. So what we did then uh, is that uh, we looked uh, at uh, Hooke's law. Okay, so what else can, you know, is there anything interesting can come up with Hooke's law? Uh, you know this probably from your middle school or wherever, that uh, when you try to pull the springs and the force is kx. What they don't tell you in middle school is that that's not the whole story, right? And so usually the springs are nonlinear objects, and so there are corrections, k2, k3, uh, and so on. And so what we argued, uh, what we argued in gym, uh, and uh, um, so, so an interesting, uh, so, so we had quite, uh, qu quite a discussion with the PRL referees at the time because they were saying, what's this? This is absolutely useless, and we agreed with that. Okay, but it's still cute. So, uh, so what we argued, uh, we argued that actually, uh, if you think about these higher nonlinear corrections to the Hooke's law, and if uh, you're talking about brittle materials, uh, then uh, the elastic theory of brittle materials uh, has zero radius of convergence. Uh, and moreover, we actually wrote some formulas, so I'm not going to go through the details, so you can uh, uh, look at the papers that we wrote. Uh, and the bottom line is that there is a kind of similar expansion uh, as the expansion for the uh, hydrodynamics I was referring to earlier, uh, except that here uh, you have, um, you know, you can focus on, say, some bulk modulus or shear modulus, whatever. Uh, and again, you do the expansion in terms of uh, 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 strain. So the role of gradient expansion uh, here plays by the powers of the strain or external pressure, for example. And then you will find out that the coefficients here grow like um, uh, n over 2 factorial. Uh, so, um, uh, so here, the asymptotic expansion uh, of brittle elastic theory uh, is due to the fact that when you have a brittle material at a finite temperature, there can be a thermal nucleation of cracks. So it's the physics of cracks that's actually responsible for this particular tails uh, in the asymptotic expansion of the theory uh, of brittle elasticity. So, so, uh, so this n over 2 factorial actually depends on dimensionality of the cracks. So if you uh, look at the cracks in three-dimensional material, uh, it's a different, uh, it's n over 4 factorial. Right, very good. So what I told you, I told you the story uh, where superficially uh, elastic theory and hydrodynamics uh, are similar, right? So they both have well-defined effective descriptions. Um, uh, by effective descriptions, I'm talking about this uh, high order of gradient expansions or strain expansion. Uh, both expansions are asymptotic uh, series, uh, and, and, and there are non-perturbative effects responsible uh, for those guys being uh, asymptotic expansions. However, the two are also very different, right? So, um, so in, in a case of plasma, uh, fluid plasma, those are the hydromodes, and in terms, in case of elasticity, those guys are cracks. Um, and you say, so what? Okay, so you say, what's, what's, uh, why, why, why uh, uh, what's, uh, 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 what's the big deal here? Because uh, uh, solids and fluids are very different. And so, so one of the uh, defining feature of being a solid is the existence of uh, transfer sound waves. Uh, and so in particular, the speed of transfer sound waves is related to the shear elastic modulus. Uh, and uh, in fluids, uh, there, there is no shear elastic modulus. And because of that, uh, the shear waves are, are purely dissipative. So they are non-propagating. 
uh, with Mattel uh, is actually uh, say, well, so, uh, and it's, uh, I was inspired by the talks that I've heard uh, 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 by uh, Matteo uh, when he was talking about uh, um, uh, elastic, uh, elastic models in holography. And so what we decided to do, we decided to actually look at uh, what actually happens with respect to uh, uh, high order expansion in, uh, in these viscoelastic materials, right? So what we're gonna do, we're gonna, uh, uh, we're gonna embed a model uh, of uh, some viscoelastic material in the holography. And what we would like to do, we would like to embed it while having a control parameter. And so this control parameter will move us between fluids uh, uh, and solids. So more solid-like to more fluid-like. And we're gonna study all derivative hydrodynamic expansion. And uh, uh, so basically, uh, the question uh, that, uh, well, at least my motivation for this work was, are there any other non-perturbative effects uh, that are responsible uh, for the uh, uh, asymptotic expansion uh, of viscoelastic hydrodynamics? Uh, what's, what's their physics? Right, very good. So now I'm gonna talk about the model. So, uh, uh, so this model has been, uh, and a similar class of model has been discussed uh, yesterday very extensively during the apparel session. So I'm gonna be uh, a little bit sketchy because I wanna show, start showing you some plots uh, and show you some neat things and talk about physics. So I'm gonna go through the steps, okay? So I'm not gonna be precise. And instead what I wanna do, I wanna give you the intuition. Uh, so why what we're gonna get is gonna be a viscoelastic material. Basically you would have no choice other than to expect something interesting to happen. Um, so, so, uh, so the model is built uh, in uh, the way I, um, I, I could have written just, uh, you know, the Q lattices that Jerome uh, proposed with other people, but instead I want to give you the way how I like to think about it. Uh, so first you start with uh, a holographic superconductor, okay? So we all uh, know and love this. Uh, and so uh, there is a field phi, and so this field phi, it's a neutral field. It's not charged uh, under the U1, under the bulk U1. However, uh, as we know, even, uh, uh, even a neutral scalar field uh, can condense, uh, can condense uh, uh, provided the temperature or, uh, 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 is sufficiently low. So this is the first step. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at a class of models uh, where um, uh, the um, um, uh, symmetry breaking, so there is a Z2 symmetry uh, in this model, and Z2 symmetry is a symmetry where phi goes to minus phi. Uh, and so the symmetry can be broken either explicitly or spontaneously. Uh, so the breaking, uh, the explicit breaking is when you give a mass term to this phi field and spontaneous breaking is as usual uh, holographic superconductor. And then what we can do, we can add uh, a bunch of fields that I will loosely call an axion, those are psi i fields, uh, with some positive coupling constants lambda 1 and lambda 2. Uh, so, so this is a Q lattice that Jerome and company proposed. Uh, and so what we're gonna do, we're gonna turn on uh, the non-normalizable components uh, for this field uh, Xi i, so there will be a profile Xi i is equal uh, k, times, uh, um, k times x. So why do we have a lattice, okay? So once I will convince you that there is a lattice, uh, then you shouldn't be surprised that there is, a, uh, uh, there is a theory of elasticity in here. So how do you see the lattice? Um, well, the easiest way to see a lattice uh, is to look at a specific value of this coupling. So if I, instead of looking at arbitrary lambda 1 and lambda 2, uh, if I set lambda 1 is equal 1 and lambda 2 is equal to 2, uh, then I can look at the model and recognize uh, that, uh, in, in fact, I can combine four scalar fields, three axion-like and uh, a neutral scalar phi, uh, into three complex field uh, with just a standard, uh, standard kinetic term. Now immediately, once you recognize that, uh, uh, then you know that um, uh, these axions, uh, uh, they, must, uh, uh, they must be real axions, so they must be periodic. And so the periodicity of these axions, once I turn on a source term for them, immediately implies uh, that my uh, spatial coordinates are periodically identified. 
This is your lattice. In fact, this is one way to see that anything related to K is actually a source term. This is something that you do not want to change. Uh, otherwise, you will, uh, you, know, you will not satisfy, for example, the first law of thermodynamics. So this is the lattice. And so finally, it's just a technical thing, is that you can introduce uh, uh, this uh, additional factor in front of the F squared. And this is in order to enhance the physics that I'm going to talk about. So this is the model. Uh, and so in the uh, last five minutes, I'm going to talk about the results. Uh, so first, let's study, uh, let's study thermodynamics. Uh, and so what you see here uh, is that uh, this uh, uh, red line. So the red line is just a vanilla Reissner Nordstrom black hole. So nothing condensed here. There is no lattice. Uh, and so, uh, so the orange one. Uh, the orange one is just a holographic superconductor instability. So it starts, uh, it starts uh, below some energy and it has, uh, it has uh, a higher entropy. So this is a, a thermodynamically favorable state in a microcanonical ensemble. And then now as you start cranking K, uh, as you start introducing lattice and your lattice spacing becomes smaller and smaller, corresponding to larger values of K, uh, you again see this spontaneous uh, phase transition, uh, the Z2 symmetry breaking transition, but this uh, transition is actually delayed. So in order to see the transition, uh, you have to go to lower and lower energy densities. So this is the thermodynamics of the model. So next, this is something that Matteo showed you yesterday, actually. You can compute the elastic modulus, and you can compute, uh, uh, by, I mean, more precisely, the shear elastic modulus, and you can compute the shear viscosity. And you see that it's non-zero. For me, um, given that I don't have much time, I'm not going to talk more about this, though there are some interesting things uh, uh, to be discussed here. For me, it's important that uh, there is uh, a non-zero shear elastic modulus, and so what I have is viscoelastic material. Very good. So now, uh, everything that I was talking uh, uh, before, that you need to build up this function uh, omega uh, sub delta, depending on the dimensionality of the operator that uh, uh, breaks uh, uh, break conformal invariance. Uh, so you have to do some explicit computations, right? So you compute uh, higher order hydrodynamic expansions, you do the Borel resummation, and you look for the uh, singularities in a Borel transform. Uh, so uh, what uh, what I highlighted uh, in this uh, transparency is exactly the technicalities uh, what you go through. Uh, so this parameter, this G, uh, is actually a ratio uh, of a, uh, for particular homogeneous and isotropic flows that we're discussing. That's the ratio of H over T. Um, and uh, so you get, uh, uh, you get this serious expansion, uh, which is factorially divergent. So what you do, uh, you're going to construct a Borel transform, uh, which is basically taking the original series and dividing the coefficients by n factorial. Uh, so if you do uh, Borel resummation, uh, as given by this expression, so if you're going to do a Taylor series expansion uh, uh, substituting the Borel uh, transform over here, you're going to recover the original uh, series. However, uh, the Borel resum you can think of as being a continuation uh, of your original divergent series. Now, if you look at this integral representation, uh, you will immediately see that whenever there is a pole in a Borel transform, there will be an essential singularity. And it is the physics of this essential singularity that is responsible for zero radius of convergence. That's it. So what you have to do, uh, you basically compute this function, you do the Borel transform, and you look for poles at, at uh, 300 orders uh, of the hydrodynamic expansions. So what you're going to get? First of all, there is no lattice. So what I am showing you uh, is uh, the, uh, the bunch of blue dots. So the blue dots are the poles in the Borel transform. Uh, so those are the guys that uh, uh, resummation uh, of the asymptotic expansion tells you is responsible for the uh, asymptotic character of the expansion. And so the crosses, uh, the crosses are uh, the quasi-normal modes computed long time ago by Starinets uh, and, uh, 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 and Nunes. And so you see the perfect agreement. So in fact, this is something that we did uh, in the earlier paper with Michal Heller and uh, uh, Jorge Noronha. 
So there is, uh, uh, this, this just uh, repeats the story that I told you that for this uh, homogeneous and isotropic expansion, once again, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the asymptotic uh, character of the expansion is due to the physics of quasi-normal modes. Now we're going to turn on this parameter k uh, and, uh, uh, and see what's going to happen. So, uh, so this is a little bit busy plot, and so uh, I will try to guide you through it. So you see once again the green crosses. So the green crosses are the quasi-normal modes computed by Starinets and Nunez. So those were the uh, quasi-normal modes at k equals 0. However, now uh, my k parameter is rather big, right? So it's equal k over t is 100. And so what the orange line tells you, how does uh, the fluid quasi-normal modes move uh, once I turn on the parameter, this viscoelastic parameter k. And so uh, at the end of the, uh, uh, once k over t reaches uh, 100, I'm reaching this uh, red cross. So what you see here, and you see once again, uh, you see the bunch, uh, the bunch of blue dots, and there is a perfect agreement between the blue dots uh, and the red crosses. So unfortunately, uh, despite all this work, uh, you didn't find the cracks. And instead, what you see is that even though the material, uh, the material is viscoelastic, uh, still um, the hydrodynamic expansion is asymptotic, but uh, the physics uh, of those expansion being asymptotic, again, are just governed by the quasi-normal modes. Uh, I'm almost at the end, so let me point out something that you already see some interesting features here. Uh, the first one is that what happens with these quasi-normal modes, uh, they approach this purely imaginary axis. Uh, actually, uh, uh, so these are not exactly the quasi-normal modes. So those are I times quasi-normal modes. So the guys approaching purely imaginary axis means that their quasi-normal modes become more and more real. Okay, so the imaginary part uh, vanishes. And so this is the most dramatic example that you can see. So over here, uh, uh, what we take, uh, we take k over t uh, being equal uh, uh, a thousand, and you can see that uh, the quasi-normal modes, uh, and the, you can see again, uh, the blue dots agree with red crosses. That's the agreement between the quasi-normal modes uh, and the poles uh, in the Borel transform after 300 orders of the uh, hydro expansion, there is an agreement. But what you see is that those quasi-normal modes, um, uh, they stop being a quasi-normal mode, and they become like your normal modes in the solid. So they are almost non-dissipative. Okay? So in particular, the imaginary part over the real part of this guy is like 10 to the minus 19. Okay? So this, this is rather interesting. And so in particular, what this implies, this implies that if you would look for the uh, uh, thermalization in the system, the thermalization uh, will be uh, uh, incredibly delayed. So those modes will thermalize, um, almost never thermalize, right? Just because uh, uh, they never dissipate. All right, so I'm going to uh, my last transparency. Uh, so unfortunately, I didn't have time to discuss uh, wh when I was talking about shear elastic modulus, I didn't talk about explicit symmetry breaking. So I talk about spontaneous symmetry breaking. I didn't talk about elastic modulus and lots of other things. Uh, one thing I want to uh, emphasize, what I didn't talk, but it's in our paper, and I think it's an interesting observation, uh, is that large order hydrodynamics knows about instabilities and knows about spontaneous symmetry breaking. So by definition, hydrodynamics and this derivative expansion uh, comes from integrating out uh, all gapped modes. It turns out that hydrodynamics doesn't know whether the gapped modes are uh, you know, above zero or below zero. So in other words, uh, if you have a hydrodynamic expansion, you can integrate out the uh, unstable modes. Okay, and uh, what we showed in the paper that uh, when you do this large order summation of hydrodynamics, you actually recover uh, the instabilities of your system. Um, very good. So there are a bunch of open questions, and uh, uh, I see Jerome uh, is getting up, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Ari. 
you're running over, so just one very quick question. Otherwise, save it for the coffee break. Conrad. Yes. Is this a reservation done only in formal hydrodynamics or in uh, arbitrary equation of state? Uh, so, so we did it in... Uh, 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 what we wrote in the paper was in regards to this model. However, we did it for a bunch of other models, which didn't even make to a paper. So I would say that the physics outcomes uh, is exactly what I was telling you, that even though there is a solid part of this viscoelastic material, the properties of the high order hydrodynamics still governed by uh, quasi-normal modes. And so we do not see signature of any other non-perturbative effects uh, in the hydro expansion other than quasi-normal modes. There is an interesting thing uh, which is related to, uh, and again, I encourage you to look at our paper. This is something that we call a wall of poles. So we do not know. So this is something that uh, we do not understand what is going on here. It can be an artifact of the Borel resummation, or it can be some physics. So, so there is an interesting uh, behavior what happens with those poles uh, when you do this resummation as a function of, you know, your solidity parameter. Okay. All right, so let's draw that to a close and thank Alex again.